All right. So welcome to a perfect day in the life with Fit Shorty Eats, a.k.a. Um, Simon and Tina, which right mm -hmm. now it's just Tina, obviously. Uh, Simon goes by another name named Chippy. Chippy? Chippy. 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 His real name is Simon, but there was one time in Borneo where he was uh, munching durians like a chipmunk, as in both of his cheeks full and two hands full of durians. And I was like, God, you're like a chipmunk. You're not going to leave any of that durian for me. And since then, he, he became Chippy and he stayed Chippy. <laughs> Does anyone else call him Chippy or just you? I think everybody online thinks of him as Chippy, I would say. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. And where did you two meet? Where did we meet? We actually met on Instagram. Uh, I was in Bali at that time. I was third year retiring. So I like you. Uh, the first place I went to in the Southeast Asia was Bali. And uh, honey, what happened? Oh, I'm just sharing your Instagram. Ah, okay, cool, cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not really tech savvy as you, you probably see. So anyway, I was in Bali and then um, I was posting these beautiful fruits, you know, papayas, durians, coconuts and stuff. And Chippy was scrolling for hashtag fruitarian. And one time, uh, scrolling for hashtag fruitarian, he found my profile and he messaged me for some, you know, just really normal messages like, you know, how did you get a visa for Bali and so long? How long can you stay? And I was messaging him back and I didn't think much of it until I think half a year later, he convinced his parents to go on a holiday, on their yearly holiday to Bali. And once his parents had left, he, incent he intended to stay in Southeast Asia for a little bit longer. And um, then he messaged me, where can we find durian in Bali? And I was like, okay, I'm going to show you. And then the moment I, I saw him, it was love at first sight. It, I was like, you know, love struck for like i was 37 37 at that time and i was like love struck for the first time in my life and uh that's how we met <laughs> what? was it the same for him well i i don't think so i think uh i think it took me it took us about three weeks of uh hanging out together before he like kind of like how was it honey three weeks right before he yeah. he dived into it you know it was really awkward because it was really awkward for many reasons at first because Chippy is like 14 years younger than me, you know, and I grew up in a society thinking like, it's not okay. It's not kosher for the woman to be 14 years older than their, her man, you know, he was just 23 at the time and I was 37. Um, wait, he was probably younger than 23 in that case, right? And uh, I was engaged to someone else at the time. So it was very inconvenient. There was wow. so many. Yeah, you there was- engaged to someone else. Yeah, you 14 I just- year older. Yeah, so there was a lot of things going against it, but the moment we met, it was like, I, I just wanted to spend all my time with him, like 24 seven. And that's exactly what we did, right? Um, we met at a cafe because I didn't want to invite him to my place in Ubud, but then when, once I met him, I was like, come on over. And we spoke until like, I think nine or 10 PM. And he, he turned around and he was like, I'm going to be here the next morning at 7 AM. And he was, and we just hit it off. We started traveling. I think within a week, we were already already on a motorcycle trip around north of Bali, around all the places I always wanted to go to, but never have been. And then a month later, we were in Chiang Mai together. And two months later, we, we were actually on a plane to Borneo because we Googled that there's Champadak season there. And we didn't know anybody who has been there before, but uh, we were so excited that we were like, yeah, we'll go anywhere. And we just continued. And, you know, our, our, our travels and our adventures continued from there on. It was never ending. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. So, so hold on. So a lot of people are going to be wondering, like, wait, she was engaged. How did that work? So had, I'm just guessing, were you, had you been engaged for a long time and it wasn't going so well? Or what's the deal there? Um, I was engaged for half a year at that point, but you know, you, you can break up a good relationship. The, the relationship was going really bad because the, the person I was engaged to had told me he was a formal alcoholic when we got engaged, but the, the truth turned out to be opposite. He was actually still amidst the, the alcohol problem. And, you know, at first I thought that I would cure him, you know, I would, I would save him in a way, but the, 
the lifestyle of an alcoholic, a person who's an alcoholic and the lifestyle of a, a raw vegan, you know, how I was in a really purist state then, you know, yeah. yoga, meditation, eating only papaya, coconut, we were clashing. So I, I think that would have never worked out regardless of whether Chip you showed up or not. Yeah. But yeah. I love how you... I love how you didn't let that stop you. Like a lot of people, like you said, like the culture, first off, like the age difference was like one mm -hmm. thing that like could have stopped you. Another thing was the fact that like you're already engaged, you know, um, like there's, there's probably so many other factors, right? Like you, you, there's so many other factors at play there that you didn't let us stop you. I mean, you probably couldn't let us stop you. It was just magnetic. It sounded like, right. You know, when, when, a, when a love, is so deep and like the even the physical attraction but also the intellectual connection is so strong it's like a tsunami wave in in a way i think when the love is so overwhelming it overtakes you so much there's nothing you can do you're yeah. absolutely powerless right i mean to this day i i feel the same way still about chippy you know we are five years oh here's chippy and here's our baby daughter nona <laughs> who is sleeping she's now seven weeks old amazing baby amazing <laughs> just like our son Leah and to this day when somebody asked me how I feel about Chippy I would give my life for him in a second if somebody said okay I'm sorry I have to kill one of you guys I have a shotgun I would say kill me I want him to live that's how I feel about him you know I'm gonna cry I'm sorry <laughs> I'm going to Post, cry. Postpartum moments, make me but, cry. I, but you know, I get, I get teary eyed really easily, but you know, these are tears of joy. I'm really happy, especially that, you know, this love came at a point in my life at 37, I had pretty much given up on men. I had my fair share of like really crappy relationships. And I was like, I'm just gonna, I'm just too weird. I'm going to, I'm going to stick, stick with the single life. And then I meet him and he's just the most amazing person ever. Like a real hey, man. How are you? So, <laughs> Hey, bro. good to connect so you guys both yeah. have you guys both have headphones connected to the computer yeah yeah so like a splitter yeah the sweet. Laptop. yeah sweet cool we don't well, have I'm, our crazy studio yet <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're able to make it in here at least for a, a few minutes i know you're on yeah, a daddy i don't know how long <laughs> to, to the first baby class yeah yeah we'll see daddy duty so you you guys have uh two children now right is that right we do. We have our son, Leo, who is almost three years old. And we have Nona here, who is six weeks old. Wow. So did you, when, when you first got together, uh, how soon after did you realize that, like, this was going to be a thing together? Like, I know you said, like, love at first sight, but for, for Chippy. I think for me, I think for me, it took about maybe three weeks of traveling 24 seven with her in Bali. Uh, there she is. <laughs> She's already crying. Okay, it's gonna be very short. So it took about three weeks for me. Yeah. Three weeks. I'll let you do that. That's all we get. <laughs> nice to see you. Man. Yeah, you too, man. Cheers. Okay. We'll have so to do, we'll have to do another interview, just me and Chippy at one point. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, to answer your question, in about a year and a half, Chippy proposed to me and we actually never got married uh, because none of our, neither of us are actually really attracted to the idea of inviting governments and paperwork into our relationship. So it, I really don't care for that and neither, neither does he. But the fact that he did propose to me was kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm serious, I'm game. And I, the other component was having kids because before we met, all my life, I had lived like, you know, 38 years of my single life, 37 years of my single life. And in that single life, I was always like, I'm the city girl and I'm not going to have kids. I was like, seriously, never interested in kids. Whereas he, he always wanted to have three kids. So when we came together, that was like really clashing ideas. I don't want to have any kids. And he always wants to have three. And we said, well, this relationship is so good. We're just not going to like, um, I don't know, resolve this difference. Like we just were like, okay, let's just travel and have fun and we can like get back to this topic whenever. And I think in the second year into the relationship, I realized that there's so much love in our relationship that it would be shame not to bring kids into this relationship. So uh, yeah, we decided to have them. And it was actually funny. We were traveling in Borneo. I would say we were high. We were high on the jungle fruits there, like this <laughs> jungle durians of any colors. and. <laughs> Uh, what you call them 
Artocarpus species, these things that they don't even, you know, have English names, like, you right. know, deep in the Borneo jungles. And back then, our, the, the names of our children and their personalities were revealed to us in like this kind of like transmission weird mode. Wow. Inexplainable. Wow. So, so you fell in love at first sight and to be saying it took about three weeks to, to finally realize that like, wow, this is someone I want to spend the rest of my life with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you had both said like um, that, you know, or you had said that you never wanted to have kids and he wanted to have kids. At what point did you, did, did you ever like formally decide it was time to have kids? Like, was it like a mutual discussion or did it just happen or how did that pan out? You know how, how we noticed uh, we were, again, we were traveling in Southeast Asia because we thrive on a nomadic lifestyle. Like, you know, we have two kilograms, three kilograms of belongings and we were just on the move, sleeping somewhere else every night for many years in Southeast Asia. And that was <sighs> like, and for me, you know, for me, that is still my ultimate dream, even with two kids under three. So the moment Southeast Asia opens, that's what we're going to do. Maybe a little bit more slower with kids now. But anyway, so we were at these epic places like in Papua or in Sumatra and Java. And we noticed that everywhere we went, we started saying things like, oh, and can you imagine Leo, our son here, or Nona, our daughter running over there? Like we were like, we were starting to bring them into conversations like, oh my God, I wish they were already here so they can enjoy this epic beach with us. And this is before and you were, this is before you're pregnant. This is our before I was pregnant. So once we were already saying, like, I wish they were here already for about a year, we knew it was time. Okay. And then the second factor was that I was hitting 40, right? You know, I was uh, by the time I was like 39, we knew it was time. Because as you know, you know men pretty much can have children until their death but yeah you can you can have children until you're like 18 90 whatever right but the female fertility goes rapidly uh, down since you know we hit 25 and beyond 35 it's just like slim pickings uh, when it comes to the egg cells so with any chance for, for the <laughs> for the three kids that we wanted we knew that we had to get started before i was 40 and i, I think that was a good call so, so I think, you know, in an ideal world, I wish that I was younger so that we still could have traveled with Chippy for like dozens and dozens of years. So we had had that experience, but be because of my age, you know, we had to get into the kids uh, relatively early. Otherwise we would have like, you know, missed that boat altogether. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's one thing to say like, yeah, sure. In an ideal world that would have happened, but like at the same time, maybe if you were a lot younger, he wouldn't have been as attracted to you. Right. Or, yeah. if you, or if you were a lot younger, you wouldn't have been attracted to him because it would have been kind of the same age. Whereas maybe if you were younger, you would have been attracted to someone older. I don't know. But like the, the chemistry yeah, between you is, is, is what it had to have been, right? And so um, what do you think is it about you two that makes you guys work so well together? Like, is he more of like the calm type and you're more upbeat or how does that work? No, we're actually very much alike. We, much. Um, we, are, we are incredibly alike. I mean, you, you think about it, we're 14 years apart, right? And he's from Belgium and I'm from Poland, but our upbringing and our core family values and the things we, the way we were raised, you know, we have, we have both come from really happy families. We had really good uh, childhoods and the things we like and the things we value are very much alike. So 99.9% .9 of the time we actually don't argue because um, I mean, you know, I do a lot of posts about relationships and stuff, and this is how I explain it to people who tell me that they're arguing with their spouses, right? Um, we have the same goals and the same vision for our future, like five, 10 years ahead, we have exactly the same vision, right? And if he, he, I want something, it's like I want to take route A on Google Maps to that, uh, to that, uh, to that goal, right? And if he has a different opinion, it, he, he wants to take route B on Google Maps. But it really doesn't matter if we take route A or route B, if the end goal is always the same. And we have the same vision, you know? We want to eat fruit, the best fruit in the world. We want to live in the tropics. And we want to see, you know, our children thriving in this beautiful garden of, of a, a nice home in Bali. And we want to travel most of the year when we are not in Bali. And, you know, that is, that is our... Shit on and he's saying and make a shit ton of money yeah that's 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 also true we want to be wealthy to the point where you know making money is not like not a non-issue so we have the same vision and we never argue because uh i realized that if if he has a 
like a different opinion about something. I'm very lenient and I'm, I'm kind of like saying, okay, well, let, let's have it your way this time. And we do it my way. So before I met Chippy, I never thought you could meet somebody so like-minded uh, like you. But Chippy is like me in another body. He's like almost like he's a, he's another body part of me. He's like my, not to insult him, but he's like my third hand or like my third leg. Okay, he's making the faces like he's I'm not. your bigger brain. You're, you're my bigger brain. Exactly. We are, you know, we're extremely like-minded. So, so that's... Uh, that's what makes us a, a, a good team because uh, you know if if in a in a relationship you're spending most of your time in a comfort confrontational mode you know confronting the other person and how you differ it's very sexy and exciting at first because you can you know fight and then kiss and make up but if you're looking at the long term right do you want to be with somebody who has opposing goals than you or do you want to have somebody who shares exactly the same vision and who's just as focused and determined on getting it as you are. I mean, I prefer the, the second route because it's just easier and more fun. I love it. Wow. This is a, this is a very fun conversation. I appreciate <laughs> the fact that you're on the show here right now. It's super cool. So you've mentioned awesome. a few times how like you have like this, these ideals and you have these goals and you have these visions. Mm -hmm. Part of which is making a shitload of money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let's rewind let's talk about when you and simon first met um and then we'll and then we'll fast forward a bit but when we, if we rewind what was a perfect day in the life for you when you were first together when we first met let's say so i would say that's during i mean things really change once you have a child because then all your focus totally. goes on having a, a child so i'm gonna yeah. say the perfect day in the first let's say two years before we had leo that would be we wake up, we're in this random homestay somewhere in Southeast Asia. We go outside, um, drink some fresh coconuts, get on a motorbike because Chippy loves motorbikes and I can't ride a bicycle, get this, but I'm a huge, <laughs> huge fan of riding uh, on the scooter, on the bike. Chippy is an incredible driver. We've driven like thousands of kilometers everywhere. So we get on a motorbike, pack our backpacks, you know, just a, a a few pounds of our belongings, all our belongings on our back. And we head into the unknown. And meanwhile, we bathe at waterfalls, hopefully naked because there's nobody there, eating durians and foraging some wild artocarpus species and watching the sunset over a beach. And then, you know, just spontaneously finding a place to stay for the night in, in a place we've never been to. So perpetual, on the move, full on adventures, completely into the unknown, but it has to be tropical. I mean, like the same done in Poland or in Canada in the snow would not be so uh, fruitful, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Incredible. Like so here, here, here we have to like plan ahead a little bit and there yeah. you can like be completely in the moment. Wow. So how did you, would you, would you like wake up and then say, Hey, today we're going to head to this waterfall. And on the way to that waterfall, we're going to grab some fruit at the stall. No, it would be even more spontaneous. We would like, for example, let's say we're in an area in mainland Malaysia and we would go to hashtag whatever the name of the area is and we would see where they have durian, where, where somebody had durian, where somebody posted durian on Instagram the day before and we would just head on over there. Um, so that's if, if it was durian driven or if there was durian everywhere and we didn't have to look for durian because let's say durian was our main staple for I think five years then we would just go to wherever there was a beautiful nature places like waterfalls springs hot springs you know uh, beaches like you know next to to fruit we we have a really high appreciation for just being in nature you know inhaling that microbiome of those you know pristine uh pristine sources of fresh water you know i, I was once uh, listening to a podcast i don't know I, I listened to a lot of podcasts, so I can't remember who it was. I think, was it Ritual or Rhonda Bryan's? Not sure. But it turns out the best way to enrich your gut microbiome is not actually via food, but it's inhaling the air uh, in pristine nature environments. And even more than inhaling the, uh, the air works, um, dips in fresh water because it turns out that the thin skin near your genitals absorbs more microbiome than you could possibly eat with, with your food. 
So that's what we were doing, enriching our gut microbiome with every waterfall, river, hot spring we could find. And it was pretty epic. Oh my God. You just described like the dream day in the life for millions of fraternians around the world. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of people would wonder, okay, that sounds great and all, but mm -hmm. how do you afford that? Did you have like a big savings account or were you bringing the money from coaching or how did that work? No, not at all. Well, first of all, uh, before I set out to Asia, um, uh, I'm an interior, I was an interior architect, right? I studied architecture and before I left to Asia, I had my own interior design practice and uh, I got burned out. Like I lost interest in it. Um, and, and also when I started eating fruits, I realized it doesn't matter because it wasn't my highest excitement, but it was still, uh, uh, I was good at the, what's it called? The, the money making part of being an architect right i didn't enjoy it anymore but it was still a business that was bringing me some money so i had some savings and once i realized that i wanted to leave it all and go to southeast asia i started eating only bananas and not buying anything and over two years of just eating bananas and living really minimalist i saved enough money to um to let me live in asia for quite a few months so that supplied money for the first year or even more i would say on my part right? But eventually savings um, run out. And then what happened then is the problem actually solved of how to get money solved itself because we started making YouTube videos of, um, of our adventures in Southeast Asia, right? And some of these videos, they, had, they reached like two or three million views on YouTube. And at that point, we were making, I think, a few hundred bucks on YouTube, which isn't a lot of money, but because we were living so minimalistically, right? You know, we were barefoot minimalists in Southeast Asia when we were, we were living with the locals on in the cheapest homestays. Just the YouTube earnings back then were enough to, um, enough to support us. So just when the, the savings money ran out, the, the YouTube appeared. And then when our YouTube um, took off, and there was one episode where we were in the Barner jungles and we were looking for the tree of the rarest durian there is, which is called the tur turtle durian, the kura kura durian. And it's called the kura kura durian because get this, the durians grow on the tree and they grow on the tree trunk, not on the branches, on the tree trunk. And it's called the turtle durian because they grow so low that the turtles can reach for the durians. And lo and behold, we were looking for that tree for years and so was Lindsay, you know, Lindsay Durian yeah. Ryder. You know, hello, Lindsay, if you're watching this, awesome friend of ours. We, <laughs> we meet up every time we can in the tropics, right? Because we're also like-minded like her. Yeah. Lo and behold, we finally found that freaking tree of that Kura Kura Durian and we were the first ones to document it. We invited Lindsay that day with us and a couple of other friends. It was this amazing discovery. And get this, the tree of the second rarest durian in the world was growing right next to that tree. So we documented both trees in one garden. You know, we had to go by boat up jungle rivers with the, the, the local tribes. It was this epic adventure. And we published this video on YouTube. And after that, it just went wild. We got thousands of messages of people like begging us, I want to join you. I just want to live one day like you live and discover those durians. And seeing that, you know, we couldn't possibly take everybody, what we did, the, the most normal thing one would do, we opened a travel agency and then we said, okay, we are now open for retreats. If you want to join us in the Borneo jungle, come and join us for like one week of adventure. And so yeah, and it was, it became wildly popular. Uh, I mean, we would sell out the whole year of retreats, right? In three days. Oh we, we, my God. Yeah. We, also because the, the durian season <laughs> in Borneo was so short. It's so short and it's so unpredictable, right? We could only host, host like three weeks of retreats, right? And each week we could only take 10 people because we wanted to, it to be like a really nice family setting where we could like, really get to know each other and make it special. And those retreats were like freaking amazing. Everybody loved it. I mean, to give you an idea, more than half of the people that came to one retreat would come to every single one of the next retreats that we ever hosted. So, 
so that was that was amazing and you know to be honest if it wasn't uh, <laughs> it wasn't for that current situation that's what we would be doing over there but as you know travel looks very different right now and there's a part of me that's really worried that those times will never happen again those days will never come back and i'm not worried at all for because of the, of the fact that it was our income at the time i'm just worried because doing that it felt like this is what we came here to do this is the way we wanted to share our fruitarian experience in with the rest of the world in the depths of the jungles you know we've we've had you know people saying almost everybody said that this was the best week of their lives we were canoeing we were we were um diving into those jungle rivers with them jumping into waterfalls eating the rarest durians on the planet but not just durians but eating dozens of other super rare fruit species right <laughs> people were crying on the daily from happiness at our retreat so that was wonderful and was, I, just just imagining this makes me feel like crying because you have as, to come as a I, I, yes i i agree uh as a you know, for Terry and myself, who also traveled as a minimalist, with nothing more than a backpack, I feel like I would have been like best friends with you guys traveling all along as well. That's all I wanted to do. That's what, all, what, this is what a lot of fraternians want to do. They want to travel, eat good exotic fruit, and hang out with other like-minded people, which is so rare and, and so precious. And uh, wow, when you combine it in an, an environment like you just described, right? In Borneo, in, in the waterfalls, in deep, luscious nature, Wow. You have to come, especially that, you know, in some places like, for example, Chiang Mai and Bali, it's really easy to find community and find yeah. good fruits, right? Yeah. But Borneo is such a remote place. And the durian season there is dictated by the monsoon, which comes wow. at a different time each year, that it's literally impossible to suss it out yourself, where to go and when to go, right? It's almost impossible to go there. I mean, we've had, you know, hundreds of people follow us go to durian uh, sorry go to borneo and message us where's the durian where's the fruit where'd you go you know there's there's nothing the the fruit market is an absolute fruit desert so that's why in borneo it's really you know you really need a guide or you really need to have been there like for example for us to to know where to go and where's the fruit season we must have landed in borneo nine times half of which were a complete mistake we landed in the wrong place at the wrong time at a time when there was like nothing but coconuts for us to eat there. It's that unpredictable. It's either full on abundance for like, I think six to eight weeks and then nothing. And some years they don't have fruit seasons at all. So that, that's why, that's why I think if you ever want to go to Borneo, you have to come with us. Yes. I love that. I love that. It's it, what's cool too, is like, again, you, <sighs> there was reasons for you not to do what you did. Like there was a lot of reasons, logical reasons for you not to just like travel the world and not make any money for a while, but you just did it because you, you felt compelled. You went with your intuition and a way provided itself, right? The universe opened up. It's like, Oh, we'll make this video go viral. Oh, we'll show you the turtle tree. Oh, we'll show you this other rare tree just around the corner. Oh, we'll make it so that, um, you, 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 are able to host retreats and that you're really good at hosting retreats and that people want to sell out right away and they want to come work with you and live with you and and uh like a way just revealed itself to you right because you went for it. you went all in i think a lot of people don't go all in because of what's in their head you went all in despite there not being anything in your head just in your heart and then a way revealed itself to you which is very beautiful absolutely that that's something a lot of people ask me they're like when you left your old job and you bought a one-way ticket to asia did you already have a plan how are you going to support yourself what you're going to do and stuff like that and these were the kind of questions people were asking me before i took the leave they were like how are you going to come back to your company when your money runs out what are you going to do there in bali there's nothing what are you going to do you know and i was saying I don't know. I don't have the answers. I just know in my heart that I have to go right now on a one-way ticket to Bali and that's it. And this was really difficult when I made the leap because both my best friend who was my business partner at the time and my parents and my then boyfriend, they were all saying, don't go. It's a bad decision. What are you ah. doing? And I had to say, no, this is what I'm doing to everybody that mattered to me and everybody that I respected. Right. And then uh, I have to say that, you know, like this, um, 
hippie sayings like the, you're always taken care of or the universe takes care of you. I used to like smirk on them, but they're actually true. Every time we were in trouble or I was in trouble, or every time, uh, let's say that our finances were running out, the solution presented itself as long as we were following our highest excitement and our true calling. And that's actually one thing. You know, what the things that you're most excited about are your true calling. So when you pursue them, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. So good. And that, that leads me to, to our next, to what happened next. Because uh, at that point, people are asking me, how did you, um, well, how did you create this lifestyle, right? Where everything solves itself. And I, and I was known for writing really long captions on Instagram. Uh, right now, not so much because I have two children. So I don't have so much time for writing, but I would write these multi-part captions on Instagram. And people were like, you should write a book. So that's the next thing I did. I, I wrote a book and we called it Follow Your Highest Excitement, which explains in five chapters, um, everything we did to create a life where things flow seam seamlessly. Is this it? So, no, this is actually our next book. This is our, our uh, How to Overcome Emotional Eating. Okay. But, but because right now we are actually giving away, this is one of the, Oops. One of them. <laughs> no problem. If you go to the highlights. It's taking me here. Sorry about that. No, uh, no worries. No worries. You go the to your reason why you want, the reason why you won't find uh, our book, how uh, follow your highest excitement right now is because we are giving it away for free when you join the 30 day raw food challenge. So okay. we're actually not selling that book anymore. We're just giving it away for free. Cool. So people join the, the, the 30 day raw food challenge here mm -hmm. and then included this with is, it comes the book. Absolutely. It's one of the bonuses we give because we want everybody not to only, you know, as you, as you know, diet is just one small, small, tiny part of well-being, right? And the book, The Follow Your Highest Excitement, talks about everything, you know, the mental game, the relationships, the how to make yourself financially independent. Too good. Mm -hmm. Too good. This is really sweet. So uh, uh, we're coming to the second bonus. There it is. Uh, if you, you were just there. Uh, 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 up here. Here, Tina's best selling book, Follow Your Highest Excitement. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. So this uh, is, is now one of your main income streams, is it? The 30 day rock challenge? No, 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 no. The, uh, the 30 day rock challenge, yes. yes. Right now, I would yes. say it's our only income stream. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, and, this, this, this again presented itself quite naturally because we, um, we wanted to be living in the tropics like, uh, like we were before, but because of the current situation, right? Uh, and the world being a little bit closed up and not being able to live in the tropics, we came back to living in Poland where I still have my old apartment. Oh. Okay. And last winter we were really trying for our diet to look exactly the way it looked in the tropics as, as in just eating fruits, bananas, orange juice, whatever. And we found it really, I found it really stressful because there was a lot of food scarcity. Like sometimes the bananas wouldn't ripen, you know, the quality of fruits in Poland, not comparable to the quality of fruits in the tropics. So we were at this crossroads. We were like, either we start cooking because the starches are always there, right? Or we expand our raw foods portfolio, meaning we add salt, we add greens and we add nuts and seeds so that we can make salads and raw foods, right? Yeah. And both of us, Chippy and I, were not a, not really attracted to the idea of cooking. So we're like, okay, let's get into raw foods, like, you know, from fruitarian to raw foods. Right. So we started making these salads and lasagnas and noodles and whatnot. And we noticed that we're still feeling pretty good. And this diet has just become so much more exciting and doable, right? Because things like cucumbers, yeah. tomatoes, lettuce, uh, cashew dressing that you make at home, they're always there. And after... Um, a few times that we were posting these new salads, people were like, okay, let's give us the recipes. What are you guys doing? What are you eating right now? 
uh, you were fruitarian for five years. Now you're a real vegan. Why? What are you eating? We want to know everything. So we were like, okay, clearly there is again potential and need here. Everybody knows to know, wants to know what we're eating, how we're eating. So we created the 30 day raw food challenge where we recorded, um, I think 33 videos uh, about the most asked and, you know, you know, the most asked yeah. pain and pain points of starting a raw vegan diet. We got all our recipes a meal planner shopping list and we packaged it all amazing so if anyone wants to succeed on a raw food diet they can go there right now they grab it 50 bucks off 47 bucks for the whole thing and they'll pretty much know everything they need to know to succeed on a raw food diet is that right at least our take on it yes yeah. <laughs> sweet cool well i think um if anyone wants to succeed in a raw food diet and they don't take you up on that offer, they're, they're crazy. Cause that sounds amazing. Uh, especially considering the fact that you could shortcut them many, many years of trial and error. I'm sure Absolutely. you made a lot of mistakes when you first started and now you shared your experiences in that to, to help them. So that's beautiful. Mm, what, so, so, so again, we, we, we looked at the past of what your perfect day in life was. You said you were very nomadic and you were just go, go, go every single day. You'd wait, you'd sleep in a new place every, every day. You'd always be on the go. What is your perfect day in the life now? Now that you've got uh, a couple of kids. Now, now. Yeah. What's your perfect day in life? Oh, perfect day in the life. Um, the ones we're having are the ones I want us to be having. The ones that, you know, you could be having right now. Could be having right now. Okay. We are waking up in a villa in Southeast Asia, preferably Bali, because that's my favorite place. We have a beautiful garden and nobody's crying in the morning. <laughs> Chip is laughing because that's a difficult one. Okay. We open up coconut. I nurse baby Nana. Chippy puts uh, Leah on the motorbike. They go to the morning market. They come back with some durians. We eat durian. Then we had to, uh, again, a waterfall or a river. What can I say? I like freshwater springs. We play there with the kids. Um, then we come back home. Those who nap, they nap. Um, then I think in the afternoon, because, you know, I do like to have my time to work. So I would say a nanny comes around uh, for a few hours so that we can work online a little bit, or at least one of us, we take turns. Oh, I missed important part. I started the day with going for a run, right? Because okay. um, right now I'm six weeks postpartum. I just gave birth six weeks ago, but I'm really like, I have um, on my 50 board for 50 bucket list, I have an ultra marathon to run. So I really want to like, um, I'm really dying to start what running distance? again. What, what distance? I, I'm looking at 50K, 50K, but I 50K for 50 years of life. That's, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll, I'll be able to pull it out, but. How old, how old are you now? Almost 43. 43. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and you, you want to wait, you want to wait seven years before you run the ultra or no? No, 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 no. I okay. don't want to wait seven years. That's just the deadline that by 50, oh, okay. I have 50 things that I want to get done or achieve before I hit 50 is just one of them. I just, I just ran a, a 50 K a few months ago. Um, it was my second 50 K ever. First 50 K I did when I was like 21. Was that the one day where you posted that you were, you just did it on coconuts and dates, coconut yeah. water and dates. Yeah. 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 I saw that post. Coconut yeah. water and dates. That's all you need. So that's my tip. Coconut water and dates. All you need blended dates with coconut water. That's all you need. But I, I, I truly believe having done that 50 K, uh, it, I forget how long it took. It feels like about six and a half hours or something. It was tough. Mm -hmm. It was rainy and hilly and all that. Um, but oh, hilly. I, mm. I truly believe that, uh, it's it's a 50k is more obviously you need some base training you need mm -hmm. you need some base training in your legs and heart but i believe anyone can do it it's just very mental very mental like just going and going and going and going to a point where it's like it's probably not even healthy to run that far but you just go because that's what you have to do you know you have to keep running so i just kept running as if i was being chased by like the the you know, the bad guys. Was your, was your target like a specific time or did you no, just, just complete? Want to, I want just to complete, complete it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I've done, uh, I've raced my whole life ever since I was like five years old. I've done running races 
And, uh, most running races I do, or most triathlons I do, I usually rank quite high. I'm, regular, I'm a good runner. This run is 50 K. I was so out of shape. This is why I say, I think anyone can do it. Cause I was so out of shape, hardly any training under my belt. And I ranked third from the last. So it's like all these names are in front of me. And then like the bottom three was like Ted Carr and then two others. Uh, and how did that feel? It felt good to know that I completed it. And I, and I still felt good with the race, despite not ranking high. Uh, just completing it was, was the challenge. Again, very minimal training. So Tippi, how, yeah. um, how does your, um, your ideal day in the life look like now that oh we have two kids? God. Uh, be left alone when I wake up. <laughs> no, just kidding. No. Uh, I don't know, man. Wake up a little bit like yours. A little bit like mine. You also yeah. want to go running in the morning. Yeah? yeah, I think definitely there should be like an hour in there where I can just do whatever I want to. Like, for example, go to a yoga class or yeah, you have meditate no. or you know. Ted, you have no idea how hard. Uh, can you hear that? No, probably not, right? No. No. Okay. okay. Well, in the background, in my yeah. earphones right now, there's a song called uh, playing. La cucaracha. The cucaracha, and it's like a 10-second song every time we sell a challenge. Yeah. I programmed it <laughs> to go off every time we sell a challenge. So yeah, somebody just bought a, the challenge. Right anyway. Now. <laughs> anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> this was this was our vision that we're basically gonna be sitting at a beach somewhere right and the la cucarachas are just gonna be going off like pings from the from the phone so good <laughs> you know I, I i had a thought of programming ours to do that too i never got around to doing it but i would love that i would love to program something it's really epic it, it's really epic it's because... very rewarding because it comes at the most strange times where you wouldn't expect it right yeah, yeah, and, you're like, you know, it, it makes you feel really great because you know that everything is automated and you just don't have to do anything, you know, Dude, it just comes in. This uh, is, this is beautiful. I love it. I, I, yeah. I, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, we should, we should definitely have another chat later about um, just the whole business side of things off camera. I would love to, I would love to talk yeah, to you yeah, about that yeah. because I yeah. think, I think the amount of attention you guys get on your posts and just the kind of people you are. Uh, I know, I know, um, Chippy said you want to make a shit ton of money and that's totally possible. If someone like myself is capable of doing it, you guys can do it for sure. Uh, you guys are, you guys have everything required to make that. So it's definitely possible. I love, I love that you have those notifications set up every time you make a sale thing or the, the yeah, song yeah, plays. We've, we've, uh, we've already sold 10, uh, 10 challenges this morning. Uh, it, it's a good morning. So, wow. so any, yeah. It's good. It's uh, it's been really, um, really rewarding because you know when we were making the the challenge, I was already like in my third trimester of the pregnancy, and you know it took a lot of effort. Already having one child and being you know seven and eight months pregnant to 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 set up this this program, and then sometimes we were like you know is anybody going to buy the challenge? You know is it is there any need? And then when we launched it and it was such a, such a massive success that that was very rewarding. So yeah, that oh, was nice. good. I'm, cool I'm, happy we, I'm happy we did it then because now that we have two kids, like Simon was saying that his idea of an ideal day is when he has an hour alone. Ted, when you have two kids, you don't have any time for yourself. Like if you have, if you have the chance to poop alone in the toilet, like that's already a win. That's already all the time you ever get for yourself in the day. Like two kids under three, it's like go, 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 go. You know, when you have kids, you have to sacrifice your entire life for this being. Sacrifice, I don't mean it in a bad way, but you know, hands on, eyes on, right? And if you're trying to do some kind of entrepreneurial work, like, you know, you're trying to be an online entrepreneur at the same time, wow, it's almost mission impossible unless you really love what you do. Like I really love working, you know, with online products and I, I love talking about raw foods and I love writing for Instagram. I love all those things. So because I love it so much, I will always find time to do it. But if I didn't love it enough, it would be very hard. That's exactly what I tell everyone I'm on the phone with. People call me, they want to start a business. If they have kids, if they don't have kids, I tell them the same thing. I say, how much do you really love this? Because if you're just doing this to try and make money, it's not going to work. 
you have to work. you have to not only be willing to do it for free you have to be willing to pay to do it that's what you need to love it and, and Absolutely. then par- par- paradoxically when when you love something enough that you would pay to do it you then get paid to do it you know it's Absolutely. very it's very interesting how that works but like that's how much you need to love it um i and- also find I also find, sorry to interrupt you, but no. if, you know, if somebody is looking for what kind of, you say niche, but I say niche, niche mm-hmm. they should go into, they should sit down and I tell them, because I you know we, I also get a lot of questions of, you know, how to create an online income or an automated yeah. income. I say, if you can't find a hundred topics to write about within your topic, within your niche, then you're not passionate about it. It's like, you know, I have, if you look into my Instagram, I have written 5,000 posts. And most of the captions are maxed out and I can write another 5,000 with my eyes closed because I, my, my headspace revolves around raw foods and all that. Right. But if you can't find, you know, a hundred topics to write about, then you don't love it. This is not your niche. Keep searching. That's really cool. That's really cool that, that you, you, you say that because I hosted a retreat uh, a few years ago. And one of the exercises at the retreat, it was, it was a business retreat for, for vegans. And mm-hmm. I, one of the exercises was, okay, we're going to set the timer right now for two hours. Everyone's going to go away. And we're going to write down 100 different YouTube video ideas for your, for your channel. And if you can't yeah, come exactly. up with 100, if you can't come up with 100 YouTube channel ideas, then you don't, yes. you don't know the topic well enough. You know, exactly. so that's exactly what you just said. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's, it, it really, it's really, it really is the, that simple. It's like, you need to know a lot about the thing. So very cool. So that, that was, your, again, rewind when you first met, that was your perfect day in the life. Now going forward or now, right now you're saying the perfect day in the life is to just have some time alone and being able to Within get back to exercise. the chaos of having two yep. kids. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, one hour, one hour to run in the morning and maybe one hour to do something like yoga, meditation or mm-hmm. stretching and then a little bit of time for some um, online work within the day and then the whole rest with the kids. And ideally, we're living, you know, in a house where in the tropics where the kids can run around naked and we can be in a gar- in a private garden and nobody has to put on any snowsuits like right now before we go out by the time the last person is dressed the first person is sweaty and has to pee again you know i mean it's zero degrees outside it's full on snow going outdoors is like a, a, a whole a whole enterprise i don't want that so so if we if we now if we now fast forward 10 years fast forward let's fast forward let's fast forward 16 years mm-hmm. right so you've got a 16 year old and you've got a 19 year old right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's a perfect day in life going to look like 16 years from now? Oh, that's easy because we have that vision like dialed in like this. <laughs> right, GP, honey? Our vision for like when Leo is 18 and Nona is 16. Yeah, that's, we're going to go raving. That's easy. You heard it. We're raving. We are raving. GP and I are raving at these beach festivals, like, you know, these psychedelic trans dance beach surf, surfer festivals in Goa and in Thai Island or in Julier. And I, you know, I'm the hottest, fittest granny on the dance floor, you know, giving it up and, you know, hands in the air, neon glow paint. I have braided gray hair and hopefully our kids uh, think that we're cool enough to still hang out with us and go to these rave with us. And yeah, and our kids are, you know, these badass nomads with like dreadlocks and, and piercings. They look like, you know, kids from Mad Max movie or oh something. Gosh. So that, that's our vision. We want, to, we want to be raving. Once once um, once the kids leave the nest, Chippy and I, we just want to rave Dance. and eat and being fruit and eating nothing but durians and coconuts. And of course, being nomadic, moving, moving, moving all the time. No belongings, nothing to hold us down, no cars, no real estate, none of that shit. Wow. So beautiful, so clean, so simple, so minimalistic. It's cool how you said durian and coconuts too, because I've written down so many times, like my dream vision is just like coconuts all day, durian all night. Yeah. That I'm completely not just content, but I'm happy with that. Like, give me really good coconuts all day, 
and really good doing all night. And I am like connected with heaven. I'm connected with God. That's upset. Tell me, I have a question for you now, Ted. So you could, you know, uh, live pretty much anywhere around the world. Why do you choose to live in Canada? I mean, like I legally, I legally can't leave the country right now. Okay. And if you could, or when you could. Yeah. So good question. So, yeah. So when I was traveling the world a lot, I was traveling for about seven years or so. And I found uh, my my main focus at the time was triathlon. I was just training for triathlon all the time, swim, bike, run, eat fruit, repeat. I I was watching your videos all the time. That was it. I'm up to date with where you were seven years ago. (laughs) So when I quit triathlon, I thought okay i'm quitting triathlon now now but i want to still be in fitness so i think i'll i'll um you know i'll get into some strength training or something right just 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 still want to keep fit i didn't do any cardio for like a good year or something just purely strength training and then uh, around the same time around the same time i was really my business was picking up and i had to really focus on on my business grow my online business and Uh, what I found was that whenever I would be in a hot, exotic, tropical country, be it Ecuador, Costa Rica, even um, Thailand, whatever, Malaysia, Laos, when I was traveling and it was hot and I had to deal with like visas and um, just these foreign countries, my focus on my business was never as good as when I went back to Canada to visit for short periods of time. Mm -hmm. I go back to Canada to visit for short periods of time. The weather wasn't as good. And that forced me to focus on my laptop more and my business grew so quickly in these short periods back home in Canada, then I'd make some money, go back to these tropics. And then my desire to work, I was like, screw it. I want to be outside. I want to be in the sun. I want to be in the waterfalls. I want to be hanging out with friends. I want to be eating fruit and just chilling. I was like sweating. My laptop would like, you know, on my lap and be like sweating my la- on my thighs, you know? Yeah. It's funny. Like the vision of a digital nomad is somebody with a laptop on the beach where I always laugh because the, the glare at a beach is so strong. You can never <sighs> possibly work just, at a beach from a hammock. It's like such a, such a oh. terrible dream. And one of the grossest things is, is the sweat on my thighs from the heat of the battery of the laptop. I hate yeah, that. Exactly. So, so anyways, um, when I was in Canada, my business would grow really quickly and I go back to the tropics. My business would kind of go down. I would just stop caring about money. I was like, Oh, I've made enough. I can just chill. And so I I then decided, okay, I'm going to go back to Canada for a couple of years, just lock in, focus and grow my business to a really high point. And then uh, when I have a lot of money in the bank um, and and I set up a really, truly passive source of income where I don't need to be there anymore, money's just coming in, then I'll go back to the tropics. And so Mm -hmm. funny enough, I come back to Canada, I do do the focus and I can't leave because of the current situation. And now I'm at that point where, hey, I'm good now. I had the I had the passive stream coming in enough to go live anywhere, like you said, but now I legally can't leave the country. Mm. So uh, that's why. Okay, so uh, if you can leave in like a few months or a few years, are you going to leave to the tropics? I haven't thought of that enough there? because of what you said. Like I at this point, I still am feeling like I don't see how this could ever end anytime soon. And mm. at the moment, um, if I do if things do open up, I don't want to go out and then they close up again. Because then I'm like, I'm I'm like, I want this to be clear for a good year or two. And I want it to be officially behind us because I don't want to be trapped out of this country. I do love this country a lot. It like, for all the reasons people don't like it, I I do like it. Um, And I've got everything set up perfectly. I'm in a, I'm in a palace. I've perfected my life here. Um, So I don't just want to give that up until I know I'm able to travel around, do whatever, and come back whenever I want freely, you know? So that's that. Uh, as far as where I would go back to, my favorite spots have been, uh, probably my favorite spots were Hawaii. That was so easy living there in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And Borneo, I'd love to go. I'd never been. I'd love to go to Borneo. Only with you, though. Yeah. Uh, only with you. And um, Costa Rica was great, too. Costa Rica was great, too. I could probably do Costa Rica again. But probably, yeah, Hawaii. I'd maybe bounce between Hawaii and Borneo. That sounds perfect. <laughs> that sounds perfect to me too. Yeah, Hawaii is easy living. Hey, I got to run in a couple of minutes, but before I go, I want to ask you a fun question, my funnest question. What's something that you strongly believe in that most people, including myself, would probably disagree with you on what's 
what's something I strongly believe in, right? That most people would disagree. Oh, I think money cannot make you happy. It has no ability to make anybody happy. Like, you know, you know that study that says, you know, uh, like your happiness level goes up until 50, 50 grand per year, right? And beyond that, you can't get happier. I, I, I disagree with that study. I think just any amount of money doesn't have anything to do with any happiness level, right? It, it does make things easier, but from my experience, Chippy and I were the happiest when we had the least money. Yeah. You know, we had the in, the, in the moments where we had no money and we had to like, beg local people and on the rural outskirts of Indonesia to let us sleep on their balcony or we were sleeping in a shed that's been deserted by a hotel that you know went under like 10, 10 years ago and that was a ruin in those moments where we had no money we were the happiest and you know and you know there's so much energy out there put into making money that we have associated making money with being happy Right. right we have made it our end goal but i think laying on your deathbed no matter how much money you have you're going to say see that uh, money doesn't make you happy love that love that that's what i think yeah and and i say something similar i say like um a lot of people say uh will say what you said was money doesn't make you happy and in my mind i'm like what what does money and happiness have to do with each other? Nothing. They literally have nothing to do with each other. It's, it's to me, it's like the equivalent of like, what does a polar bear and a pencil have to do with each other? Nothing. One's a polar bear, one's a pencil. Something is money. It's a tool. It's like a hammer. And happiness is an emotion that comes from within. They have nothing to do with each other. Yes. It's like a freaking penguin and a piece of paper. They're nothing to do with each other. But people keep associating it because they, you know, they, they see people on Instagram, they see people on YouTube and they're like, wow, they have this and they have that. It'd be nice to have that. But one thing you said for sure, it, it can make life easier, but it, it won't change your life, life easier. Yeah. Yes. I but, think for most people, when they think about the times when they were happiest, they think about the times when they were falling in love with someone for most people. Yeah. Right. Or that those first few weeks of being in love or that, that finding that perfect soulmate once and for all. And that has nothing to do with how much money either of them had at that moment. Yeah. Sweet. Well, this was really cool chatting with you. Uh, I wish we could talk for a lot longer, uh, perhaps in it's the future. It's been awesome. And uh, let's connect uh, over, over Instagram again. Let's do it. Thank you for this conversation. It's been yeah. awesome talking to you, Ted. You as well. Cheers for now. Peace out. And again, if you guys want to connect with, uh, with the Fit Short Eats fam, you can go over here and give them a follow. You can add to their 58,000 followers. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, if you want to get started with the 30 day raw food challenge, you can click right there and get it while it's Hot. on sale. Get it while it's on sale. <laughs> Save 50 bucks. All right. Cheers. Peace. Bye for Take now. Take care. Take Bye. care, Ted. Uh, how do I stop this? There we go.